ahead and set up our recording here. So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our Transcription Center Collections Deep Dive, where every month we're going to be speaking with a Smithsonian expert to get more information about the projects that we've been transcribing and exploring in the Transcription Center. I'm Caitlin Haynes, the program coordinator of the Smithsonian Transcription Center, um, which is the Smithsonian's largest online community platform for crowdsource transcription and review. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started today. A quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we are live streaming right now on our YouTube channel. Uh, the full recording of this webinar will also be available on YouTube with captions following the event, probably sometime later this week or next week. And if you're joining us in our Zoom webinar today, you can use the chat function or the Q&A to post questions at any time throughout this discussion. Um, you can also uh, get live captioning. We have that going right now, but if it is not showing up on your screen and you need it, you can click that live transcript button just at the bottom menu bar on your Zoom. Um, and then you click show subtitles. If you're watching live on YouTube, feel free to post comments and questions there. You can also tweet us at transcribesi or email us directly at transcribe at si.edu. Um, here with us today in the background is Emily Kane, our community coordinator, who's going to be following along behind the scenes, um, monitoring our chat um, here and on YouTube, and dropping relevant links to specific projects uh, and collections that we talk about today. Um, so today we're going to be discussing the history of women aviators and military service and the many incredible groundbreaking, groundbreaking excuse me, female pilots whose stories are part of the archival collections at the National Air and Space Museum. This year alone, we've transcribed thousands of pages of letters, scrapbooks, interviews, articles, and more from pioneering aviatrix, ensuring that their achievements are preserved and more easily shared with the public. Whether you helped to transcribe these materials during Women's History Month or another time in this year or in previous years, or you're completely new to this process, uh, welcome. This is a great opportunity to ask questions about these incredible collections um, and the Air and Space Museum's archives in general uh, and the history of women in flight. So big thank you to everybody who helped in transcribing these materials in the past. You really are making a difference to our collections. Every word transcribed ensures that our historic materials are searchable, accessible, and text readable um, for researchers around the world. So you really truly are helping us bring history to life and sharing these stories from the past with our um, peers and with future researchers. Curious learners everywhere, as we like to say. Um, so uh, if you're interested in joining our volunteer community, we are, uh, and you aren't already, we are going to be posting information about that in the chat. Um, but please, again, feel free to reach out to us at transcribe at si.edu with any questions about becoming a digital volunteer. So let's dive into today's topic. So here with me today is Patty Williams, the Supervisory Acquisitions Archivist and Deputy Chair for the National Air and Space Museum Archives. Hi, Patty. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm glad I can be here and uh, share some things with our wonderful volunteers. We really, speaking for the Air and Space Museum, we appreciate you guys so much because we have so much material and the stories are kind of buried and what you're doing by transcribing is you're making them accessible to a wider possible audience as we can and that's great. So big thank you from all of us here at uh, NASA Archives. Awesome. And are you in the archives today? I am in the archives today. <laughs> I'm back in uh, part time. So and uh, Ufar Hazi will be opening on May 5th. So hopefully if some of uh, the participants are from the area, they can uh, come out and, and see our wonderful collection. Awesome. I know I will be coming with my family soon. Um, my little one has never seen Hazi and all oh, the airplanes okay. are incredible. <laughs> Um, so maybe to get us started, and I know we're going to talk about a lot of things today, um, some collections that I know I'm personally interested in and I know our volunteers are as well. Um, but maybe we can talk a little bit about one of the earliest female pilots whose materials we've transcribed in a number of different collections this year and last year. Um, but we most recently transcribed her scrapbook in March as part of our Women's History Month campaign. And that's Ruth Locke. Can you tell us a little bit about who she was and what was her role in the aviation field? I can. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to back up a little bit and try yeah. to frame this a little bit. Please. Um, 
I'd kind of like to start, for those of you who don't know, uh, NASA Archives is part of the National Air and Space Museum. We have about 18,000 cubic feet of material dealing with aviation and space fields. I uh, actually am coming up on my 33rd year of being in this position uh, as acquisition archivist. And when I first started in the uh, late um, 1880s, I really feel that old sometimes, 1980s. <laughs> Uh, our collection was mostly technical in nature in that uh, we collected material that talked about the history of technology. And that's a very important field and that's something we continue to collect in. But certainly uh, more recently and ever since I've been here, I've always tried to collect uh, the stories and voices of minorities, women, uh, African-Americans, uh, et cetera to kind of round out this picture. It's not just the technology, but it's the people behind the technology that makes aviation and space such interesting topics. Um, and so we've really started to do that because it makes aviation history so much richer because you're talking about cultural history, social history, and um, it's just, it really brings their kind of these hidden voices forwards and makes it a much richer context. For, for aviation and space. Like I said, we have about 18,000 linear feet, 2 million photographs, 1,600 cubic feet of tech manuals, 2 million drawings. So we have a lot of material. So what do we push forward to the transcription center? Well, one thing that we try to push forward are these uh, stories that are not so well known, which is why we've been sending a lot of our women's history material and I'll be talking about them. The first one we're talking about, uh, we'll be talking about is Ruth Law, who was a very early aviator. Now I say that she got her license in 1912. Women since the very beginning of flight have been involved and infatuated with it, right? 1780s, uh, it's right uh, relatively a, a new field of history, 1780s, right? When you first started seeing people go up in balloons, the first woman was a passenger in the balloon in 1784. That was seven months after the first ascent at, at all. Uh, so you can see that from the very beginning, women were very interested in this. They were interested in it and they wanted to participate and tried to find ways to participate. First as spectators, then as passengers, then learning how to pilot balloons and other lighter than air, and then of course aircraft itself. So if you look at Ruth Law in 1912, she was the sixth uh, US woman to get a license. So very early, the first woman, Harriet Quimby, was 1911. So very soon, but you have to realize that flight was something that people were all very interested in since mm -hmm. 1784. And women are very interested in that and they have been continually pushing to get into it because it has taken a long time. There has been a long curve towards justice of letting women participate in aviation, especially as pilots. And you will see this. I mean, I named, when you, know, when you asked me what kind of collections I'd like to highlight, I said, oh, let's do some women in the military. It's a very important field. But the fact of the matter is, is we don't have that many collections dealing with women in, a, in the military. And the reason is, is there's still not that many women pilots. Mm -hmm. I just looked up uh, for this lecture, October 2020 statistics of the Air Force, 21% of people that serve in the Air Force are women, 6% of them are pilots. Wow. So you can see that even with this long arc of people trying to get in, it's, it's still a while. It's still the minority. Right, and that is because they had to deal with the skepticism of the male pilots and the overall culture of sexism and these traditional roles and the roles that women were prescribed to and how they broke out from that. So a little bit of background, just to kind of frame it. That's perfect. Let's talk yeah. about, Thank let's you talk for that. About, uh, Ruth well, and Law. can I ask before we kind of dive um, further into Ruth Law, thank you for sort of giving us that that contextual background that helps that helps me too. Um, but can I ask as well for those of us who aren't as familiar with the Air and Space Archives, you know, what is sort of the archives connection to the museum itself? You know, why are you all even collecting these things? Who uses your archives? Um, sure, we are. Uh, we are a collecting unit, so like just like our curatorial staff collects artifacts, we collect the two-dimensional. So we collect the film and the photographs and the papers and the scrapbooks and everything like that. 
Um, and that's really just, you know, we have training as archivists to deal with this, to make this material available to the public, especially now through the Transcription Center. Mm -hmm. um, and we collect, our collecting rationale is really the same as the museum. What the museum chooses to collect, we try to mirror that, and we try to collect that same thing only in two-dimensional. So while somebody might collect, you know, the, the right fly or something like that, well, we collect uh, correspondence of the Wright brothers back and forth to that to kind of, again, give And we've transcribed the their flight logs. Yes. Yeah. To keep the artifact, give it context, and mm -hmm. to give it these, all these other dimensions and these other connections that you start to see about who's talking to who and how the technology jumps. So Fabulous. that's what we collect. And I will say, perhaps this is a good time to mention that we only collect about, I would say less than 20% of what is offered to us. And we okay. hardly ever go out and solicit material. And one of the exceptions is a collection we'll be talking about a little later today, uh, the Helen James material, because usually it's too much just to keep up with the flow of people who want to uh, donate things to us. But it's wonderful. We don't have a budget to buy uh, materials, so it's wonderful that the uh, public is so supportive and will donate things so that everyone can enjoy it. And once Hazi reopens, um, will the research room be reopening in terms of it will people want to research this stuff in person? Yes, uh, I think it is not going to be May 5th because we have the caps put on on how many people can come into the building. Okay. And I think at the beginning, they're going to save that rightly for the people who are going to see the museum. But we will be open. Typically, before, before COVID, we were open uh, Tuesday through Friday, uh, 10 to 4. And uh, anyone can come in and do research. If you're below a certain age, we ask that a parent come. But we certainly have all the way up from people writing books, uh, to to uh, to uh, teenagers doing history um, history fair history oh yeah the national history national history fair yes yeah. stuff as well sorry I totally blanked on that but we have people that come in and use us for that as well and we're happy to support all those awesome um, okay well that's fabulous and really helpful and again if anybody has any questions about the archives in general um, or doing research at the archives online or in person feel free to top, pop them in the chat we'll also um, leave time at the end for questions um, so yeah let's dive into Ruth Law so as you said she's not she's definitely not the first female aviator and she's definitely not the first female pilot that's licensed in the United States um, but she is the first in other ways um, yes. and breaks a lot of ground in other ways as an aviator. So can you tell us a little bit about her and what we sure. described? And, and to, I should say that, you know, the first licensed woman pilot was 1911. The Wright brothers didn't fly until 1903. So 1912, that's, she's not the first, but she's pretty darn close to being the first. And she was the first at uh, a couple of areas. Uh, she was the first woman to, um, uh, she was first person to, first woman to loop the loop, the first woman to fly at night. Uh, and in the scrapbook that we'll show a couple of things from, um, she, at night she would put firecrackers, light fireworks on the edge of her wings. And, um, and then she would go up and loop loops. You can see at this, uh, this bottom uh, photograph here of Ruth Law in the middle. Uh, that's a picture and the picture above actually shows her in the sky uh, with uh, spelling out enlist now. This was actually for one of her uh, military endeavors that she was trying to help the military with. She set a lot of um, records. She got into aviation. Her, her brother was called uh, the human fly. He was, uh, he liked to scale tall buildings in New York City. He was a stunt person and he jumped out of a plane and, but he wasn't really interested in flying a plane, but uh, Ruth was. And so she was married and she had her husband try to get her uh, lessons from the Wright brothers who would not teach her how to fly because they didn't think women had, should be able to fly, but they did sell uh, the airplane to her and she used that. And her first thing was she went down to Florida and uh, uh, set up on a beach, a hotel beach area and would take passengers up for $25 for 10, 10 minutes and you would get a nice little certificate. That's a lot of money. It was, it's $600. I wow. actually did the math. 
So she was doing that. She was doing a lot of barnstorming and, and stuff like that. A lot of stunts, a lot of crazy things like flying with, with two people, climbing out above on top of the other pilot, climbing above the wing, strapping herself into a harness. And then they would loop the loop three times while she was on it. So just like really crazy stuff. She was really only active for 10 years and she uh, survived to ripe old age, I think, because she got out of it when she did. Uh, but she was a really fabulous, fabulous pilot. And even the men pilots were like, she's a great pilot. She uh, wanted to, right as we were in 1917, she was sent over to look at the state of the French aviation, military aviation, and reported back on that. She really wanted to fly combat. Oh, I should also say her Another one of her big claims to fame is she set the record nonstop Chicago to New, to New York, which it was in uh, like 560 miles, but showed, really showed the practicality of if you can get to Chicago to New York in just a day, this aviation, we this have is the ticket, here. this yeah. is what we got to do. Um, so she really wanted to fly. She was told no. She was allowed, she was the only woman allowed to wear a military outfit, though, military un uh, uniform, non commissioned. And she went around and gave, um, uh, raised uh, funds for Liberty loans. She mm -hmm. would go up at night and write Liberty in the sky with her airplane and get that. She would, uh, uh, come into a field, uh, a recruitment field and drop uh, pieces of paper that said enlist now. So that was kind of her point to do it. And she wasn't the only one. Catherine Stinson also did a little bit of this um, as well. Uh, but they were really the only two. And she was the only one that was kind of recognized as, well, she was at least able to wear the uniform. And on that slide, when you look at the slide, you can see there's an article she wrote uh, saying, gee, I so want to fight and be part of, uh, I, I, I want to, I have these skills. I have mad skills and I want to be able to use them for the United States, but she was not um, allowed to do that. And I would also say that just as an aside, this scrapbook is a wonderful scrapbook. I remember first seeing it 33 years ago and just falling in love with it. And she but compiled it, was, it herself, correct? She compiled it herself. 1916 to 1918. So a lot of this stuff about different ways she was trying to support the military. But we could never really make it that available because uh, as one of my colleagues says, it's the scrapbook that's the size of a torso. It's like three feet by two feet. And oh, I like had no idea it was that big. Six inches thick. And it was so big that it was hard to get out and it was hard to, um, to, to let researchers actually look at it and also you can kind of tell a little bit on this page but there's all kinds of different mediums stuck into scrapbook right you got photos you have these little uh newspaper clippings you have these little like uh ephemera saying you know buy liberty bomb uh, li liberty loan bond and drop a bomb on the germans there's also her uh she showed her dog and dog shows her dog ribbons that that he won or in here. There's just a wide variety. And so by scanning this and all the volunteers translating, it really makes it so much more widely available. Uh, and we just, this was a story and an artifact we always wanted to be able to showcase more and we just were not able to until we were able to actually get it scanned and make it available and get it transcribed. So it's really wonderful to, to preserve this. Um, Ruth Law never, you know, World War I uh, ended. She did a little touring in uh, the Philippines and Japan and China. She was all over the place. She had her um, own flying troop. Right. She had her own flying troupe, uh, the Ruth Law Flying Circus. And, uh, but her husband was having, kind of having a nervous breakdown uh, because she kept trying to do these elaborate stunts. Because especially after World War I ended, you come back, you have all of a sudden, you have a whole group of men who know how to fly because Uncle Sam taught them how to fly, right? right. They didn't have to like scrounge to find somebody who would actually teach you to fly and come up with the money, right? The military did that. Um, so um, 
so they they were coming back they had the the surplus airplanes that the military was getting rid of and the, people were just doing these more and more crazy kind of shows oh, wow. and her husband was really worried that she would get hurt now this the official story that she tells uh if you read any of her uh, articles or stuff is that she opened up the paper one morning at breakfast and across the top it said ruth law retires and that she didn't know it that her husband had put it in because he was tired of her wow. being so worried but um i think it was probably she may not have known it but i think they certainly probably talked about that it was time for her to get out interestingly she of course had a very hard time when they got out when she left flying and went to like gardening because she didn't even fly for fun anymore i mean when she stopped she stopped and her next flight was to washington dc for an anniversary of the wright brothers um playing at the smithsonian which but, there's a newspaper article in her scrapbook about right right there is and but it's really you know telling that she had such a hard time adjusting to having all this freedom and being able to do this and then kind of being stuck back in this role as a housewife did she stay with her husband what did she stay with her husband? She did. She <laughs> did. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there was, you know, a lot of the early women pilots, like Harriet Quimbley and stuff, you know, they died, they crashed. And then the ones that survived kind of, you know, they had a shorter period of time and then they, they, they left it. They left yeah. the field. But Well, and I think one of the thing that's, things that's so exciting and interesting, too, about transcribing such a variety of materials and information like are available in Ruth Law's scrapbook is that as you all could see there's a lot of newspaper articles just like Patty was saying <clears throat> which not only of course highlight Ruth's achievements but also the achievements and the stories of other female aviators at the time that she was doing these air derbies or races or shows with or against competing against mm. um and you can sort of see not only that that fuller picture of what's going on in aviation and women in aviation but also um how they're kind of supporting one another and trying to you know that competition of course too but trying to kind of navigate the field um together literally and figuratively <laughs> um and that's always been really fascinating i mean you mentioned harry quimby and um katherine stinson and and all of these female aviators are sort of scattered their stories and their images and their um kinds of achievements uh in these different air derbies are, are sort of scattered throughout a lot of these collections because they're all being talked about in these various different features and newspaper articles right and one of the uh books that we're going to send next to you some scrapbooks to do is called the mosant family scrapbooks and mosant uh flying school are the ones that taught harriet quimby how to fly and the second women pilot american women pilot to get a license was matilde mosant the the sister of one of those and again those books are so big that we couldn't really do much with them but we've recently had them scanned and we're really excited to get those out because not only does it talk about the Mossant, you know, their flying school, which was fascinating because all these early flyers, but it's just full of stuff on Harriet and Mathilde because they were really putting them out there to say, look, a woman can fly, anyone can fly, come, come spend money and come to our school and let us teach you how to fly. Wow. So some really fascinating stuff there. So be on the lookout for that, for those of you who want to uh, delve more deeply into the very early okay, pilots. Well, I mean, this is, you know, we talked a little bit about Ruth Law <clears throat> being the first woman allowed to wear a military uniform and helping in the war effort, but not mm -hmm. being allowed to actually be part of the military service or combat flight or anything. Um, but yet at the same time, World War I did open up a lot of new opportunities with a ton of limitations mm -hmm. for women in a lot of these different industries. After World War I, is there any shift in that in terms of women pilots and female aviators or in the aviation field related to military service? Um, you know, as we sort of think about women like Mary Charles, like how is, this sort of shifting these opportunities yeah. um military not so much but one of the good parts about all those surplus planes is they were also cheap enough that women 
could start to try to buy them as well and, and learn how to fly. And I had picked, I wanted to highlight Mary Charles a little bit. Most people probably don't know her. She was, uh, she got her license in 1929 and she was in a, a several uh, uh, air derbies. Um, she knew all the women of that time. She knew uh, Mathilde Moussant, you know, Ruth Law, Amelia Earhart, she was good friends, Poncho Barnes. She's somebody you don't, you don't know about it so much, but when you look at her collection, it is just jam-packed with all these connections, right? And all these organizations that she served with, like the Women's Air Reserve, which was a group of women who were training women to be pilots uh, in cases for like national or civic emergencies, like to fly in pe doctors or get people out of areas where people were sick and they couldn't get to them, et cetera. The reason I highlighted this is I thought that this was so interesting. And one of these, um, one of these uh, folders is this peace, peace through preparedness. And this was a extravaganza that Mary Charles had come up with as a way to use aviation to promote um, peace through, through defense and through aviation. And she specifically was targeting this for women. And this whole program was going to be done by women flyers. And if you look at kind of, if you can see the kind of the page uh, next to her license, it talks about the reason she's decided to do this is, is that A, that she's found that women aren't interested in aviation, by and large. They're not interested in the aviation of other people. It also talks about how they're not even that interested in using their vote properly. So, but the last one is, is but every woman she's talked to had high esteem for the women pilots. And I think that that really says something. Even if they didn't want to be a pilot, people saw these women pilots in their non-traditional gender role as being something to admire and something to emulate and as just a wonderful, you know, a wonderful thing to set your sights on. And I think it's interesting that Mary Charles Charles, Charles here is saying, women aren't concerned enough about this as they should be. How can we make them more interested in being prepared for the next war? This was coming out in 35, Europe already, not a particularly happy place to be. And, uh, and she's like, by, by having women pilots come in and talk about how important defense is, and to talk to women about how they should get their pilot's license so that they can be ready. So if, heaven forbid, we get into a war or anything, we'll have more, more pilots available and that they can have this job. Now, this didn't go anywhere, of course, but I just think it's interesting. You can't say that, okay, people during World War I, were in, women were interested in doing it, and then in World War II, even in this intra-war period, women were interested and wanted to serve. And, and in this particular case, I mean, this, I, I encourage you guys to look through all the pages, but she's got it down to uniforms. It was very much in a military sort of way that, that she wanted to emulate this group to do. So just a little something, not something you typically think about in military, but it does show that women were interested in it and they wanted to pursue these avenues. And clearly they, you know, some women were, as you say, you know, heavily involved in aviation in this interwar period. Right. right. Um, especially as, as there is a surplus of planes. Right. Um, what is the like air reserve um, unit that Mary was a part of? Uh, Women's Air Reserve was, uh, was a group of women, um, sort of like the 99s, which you might've heard of, which was another women's group um, of pilots. And the Women's Air Reserve was a group, uh, they had uh, an aerial ambulance was one of their things and they would fly in and, and retrieve people who were sick that, you know, if the men were too busy to do it, they would do that kind of, that kind of work. So um, they were, and a lot of people were in it. Uh, Louise Thaden is another collection that's going to, to be going live soon. She was heavily involved in this. Phoebe Omley was heavily involved in this. And so it was like a, a I don't want to say social club because it was more than that, but it was, 
a group of women who got together and kind of came up with their bylaws as ways to use flying to do good for the community, civic good for the community. Wow. And that seems dangerous in itself, right? Yeah. Do, like aerial rescues. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, well, as we sort of move into the historical timeline, move forward in the historical timeline and talk a little bit more about some brand new projects that are up in Transcription Center. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what is happening in World War II? You know, there we sort of saw a maybe possibility of um, female aviator involvement in World War I, and then you see some different opportunities coming up um, in the interwar period, but there's still a lot of obvious restrictions right. um, and sort of backwards thinking still that women should be involved in the war effort at all, let alone going up in a plane. Um, does that change at all in World War II? It does, and it kind of lays the foundation for, even though it took years after this, for fruition, kind of laid the put down the claim and showed that women could fly military aircraft. And of course, here I'm talking about the women Air, Service, Air, Air Force Service pilots, um, the WASP. And they were preceded, there was actually two groups in 1942, one by Nancy Love, and I'm looking at this because I can never remember what the, I want to give you the full name of it, Women's Auxiliary uh, Fairing Squadron, and then Jackie Cochran, uh, also did the Women's Flying Training Detachment. They were two different groups that were kind of like trying to get an in and saying, gee, can women, as civilians, but can they help out the military? And in 1943, they were consolidated into the WASP. And they put out a, um, a, uh, a call for women uh, to have, who had a certain amount of hours and as within a certain age. Uh, couldn't be older than 35 because they had to be out of there by 40 because 40 was menopause possibly and in the words of the military people you know women get irrational when they go through that so very very strict um rules uh had to have some flying hours they had 25,000 women apply for this program which shows you the groundswell of women who wanted to be pilots and wanted to support the military in the United States. Out of that, they selected 1,800 women and they went through uh, training at uh, Sweetwater, Texas. And in the, two, in the year and a half until they were disbanded out of uh, the 1,800, uh, like I think, uh, like 1,072 actually became pilots. Those pilots, flew over 60 million miles. They flew every different kind of plane that the military was using at that time, from the manufacturers to the different bases. They moved personnel. They flew uh, with targets behind them so that the military could uh, work on target practice. And they, uh, people think that they probably did the work of 900 servicemen they saved that was 900 servicemen who could actually serve overseas in the military um so uh they did 80 percent of all the fairing in the united states during that year and a half were done by the women of this group great group they loved it um i will say almost all white one or two um i think chinese americans i think there might have been one native american uh, no African Americans. Uh, they made it to, some of them made it to the final segment until the interview part, and they didn't get it. And uh, I think. Would it have been. Um, I know that a lot of the American military was also still segregated right. in some ways. So would that have been segregated as well? Well, it. it it wasn't really big enough to, and Jackie Cochran okay. is like, like talking to Janet Bragg, who was a fabulous African-American pilot, was just like, it's enough to fight sexism. I can't fight sexism and racism. So it is, it, Jackie Cochran is who she is, right? So that's kind of what happened there. But um, they were very successful. They, uh, there was a few um, deaths unlike uh, their military, uh, the men who served in it, um, 
they didn't have veterans benefits. They had to pay for their own funerals if they died or the families had to pay for their own, own funerals. So we come up to 44 and part of the appeal was they're like, okay, you're gonna be civilians helping out the military, but we're going to fold you into the Air Force. This is just a first step. But come 44, we're gonna win the war. Men are starting to come back. Male pilots are starting to come back. And they're like, you know, we don't, we have such a surplus of men, we don't really need you anymore. And so Congress decided to disband them. Uh, and I think that's, to me, that's really one of the heartbreaking stories of aviation. It's just that you had these group of very competent women who learned how to fly, loved serving their country, and then boom, it was done. Now, they were happy the war was over. A lot of them were married or had boyfriends that came back. They were all happy, but they could not sustain jobs in aviation. And, and for a lot of the men who couldn't do that, they could still serve in the military, but the women couldn't do that. And it actually took 30 years until 1977, until Congress actually recognized that the WASP should have veteran status. Because up until that time, they couldn't use, because they were civilians, they couldn't use the veteran hospitals, any, any of those kind of benefits that veterans rightfully get, they were not allowed to do it. And finally, and that's one reason why I selected uh, B. Hey Duke's collection is that she was the president of the Order of the Fifth Finale, which was their reunion group. And she's the one that actually pushed it through. And she just passed away in January at the age of 100. But so they got recognition in 1977. And then they finally got the Gold Congressional Medal in 2009. But uh, B was only one of three out of the 1,072 that were still alive. To wow. Get. So that's how long the recognition took to reach for them. But what the WASP really showed is that women were competent mm -hmm. and they could do their job. But they ran against right into the skepticism of the men coming back and the overall culture at the time that said, okay, thank you for your help. Now get back where you belong. Get yeah. back into the house. Which a lot of women right. experienced right, during right. World War II, obviously. Right, right. Um, as many women were kind of employed and, and allowed to pursue various opportunities throughout right. the military, right. um, on the, especially on the home front in factories and in um, various, you know, kind of mechanical jobs, things like that. Um, right. So, yeah, there's a huge shift when the men come back. Um, you got to get back in those prescribed gender roles, right? Right, right. Got to um, do that. Now, exactly. in, in 19, so 44, it's debanded. 1948, Congress actually passed the integration for women, saying that women can serve in the military. Okay. So 1948, and that 1948 was pretty momentous all the way around because that's also when Truman did the executive order saying desegregation. Yep. So it's like, you know, the military in many ways leads the way for the rest of the country on saying we're, we're dictating this and then hopefully it falls further down into non-military areas. Uh, which brings up the next woman I wanna talk about, which is Helen James, um, who joined the Air Force in 1952. Now, I should say that the order was very important because it allowed all the women that they could join the different, uh, all four of the different um, arms of the military. Okay. But they couldn't be pilots. They couldn't be pilots. They had to do, perform these other behind the scenes kind of um, uh, task. Even now, not in combat. What? Not even in combat. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That didn't happen until 1977 when they started to train women pilots. It's wow. really a very long curve here. Um, but Helen James joined in 1952. And she was a uh, she was a radio um, officer, and then became a crew chief. She got great reviews. Uh, she was promoted, uh, and then in 1955, she uh, fell to the lavender scare. Um, the Office of uh, Special uh, Special Investigation mm -hmm. were trying to root out uh, gay and lesbian people in the military. 
Uh, they brought her in, they, it, uh, they questioned her, and they discharged her dishonorably. And this was all connected, um, for those of you not familiar with the Lavender Scare, this is also connected as well um, with the Red Scare that I think um, is a little bit more well known, um, but they went hand in hand where the federal government is looking to root out what they perceived as devious people um, in the federal government and throughout the military. So communists, anyone they think has some sort of different political leaning, um, uh, as well as um, individuals that they felt were threatening in some way, allegedly including um, homosexuals. Uh, and so that's where you get the term the lavender scare. Right. And they were like, you know, they can't be trusted because they can be blackmailed because they're being immoral. So, uh, so she was devastated from this. She didn't in fact, tell her parents what had happened. She moved, eventually moved out to California, had a, had a great career. She's still alive. She's uh, in her nineties now. Great career as a physical therapist, uh, actually worked with some Olympic skaters. I mean, wow. she's just a fascinating person, but it always really bothered her because again, she couldn't get uh, veteran benefits from this. And so she decided at age 90 that she was going to sue the Air Force to get her discharge changed to honorable where she could have the benefits that all the other veterans had. Wow. And I actually, I talked a little bit earlier about how we usually don't go out and solicit things because we're so busy handling what people are offering us. But I read about her story in the Washington Post and I was so taken with it because here's another example of a voice that was silenced mm -hmm. that wanted to make a contrib contribution to aviation and couldn't do it, wasn't allowed to do it. And that story is an important story. Yeah. It really shows how aviation history is not in a vacuum. It's a part of the larger history of the United States. And we have to record those stories and we have to keep them and we have to make them accessible. So I actually contacted the reporter and said, can you put me in contact with her lawyer who contacted me? And I, and I talked to Helen James and I said, look, I noticed that you had a photo album. We'd love to have the photo album and any of the legal paperwork you have. And I said, I don't care if they come back and tell you no, that you don't get it. If you're successful or not, I don't care. Your story is still important that you had the gall to say, this isn't right. I'm 90 and I'm not going to, I'm not going to take it anymore. I want you to make this right. So she agreed to do it. And shortly thereafter, they did, they did actually, um, say that yes she was a veteran and i got to meet her because one of the perks of being a veteran is you can do honor flights uh which is where they will fly veterans out to washington dc to see the different sites and memorials so she i she was actually able to fly out on that and present her photo album to us wow. at the time and her legal paperwork and that's something that we just i think made live today is it about 30 minutes paperwork. ago and uh, it's just, it's again, it's a, it's a very, it's a wonderful story. And I'm so glad that uh, the Transcription Center is able to, to work on it because it's, it's a story that needs to be told and it's indicative. And you know, it's just, we have other uh, collections like this as well. We have age discrimination for pilots, one that's just becoming available. We have several collections of African-Americans being discriminated against and winning uh, e either legally or not. And, and, and these stories are all so powerful and really, yeah. you know, just their gumption of staying the course and saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm worthy. I am worthy of, of being a citizen and being treated like a citizen. So it's really a wonderful story. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, I just made the project live like 30 minutes ago and Emily <laughs> put the, the link in the description, but I myself have not read through those documents yet. And so I am really looking forward to them. Um, it's a really fascinating part of history. And, and, you know, even as we go into the 1950s and 60s and you're seeing the shift in the actual like legal regulations and what is allowed in the military um, and what is allowed in other industries. You're also seeing women pilots um, in the commercial airline industry, things like that. But, but it's still with this sort of grain of salt with a lot of discrimination that all women are facing in the workforce at this time. Um, right. But I think, yeah, and, and especially in aviation because that was seen as such a male dominated yes. field. 
and really what it took uh, you you're very right there and talking about what what hap what helped that to change the general state of the united states all the anti-discrimination legislation the civil rights legislation even things like title nine all those things that got people thinking that they're required to treat women equally but also mm -hmm. kind of thinking that kind of a reprogramming of yes of course women should be treated equally and and being able to do that i mean women had a very hard time even being airline pilots why is that because they always lost out to men who had more experience. Why did they have experience? Because they came out of the military. Yep. And there are still less female pilots. Right. Um, and as you said, in the military and in the commercial industry. What about like, um, are things changing at all in NASA at this time? You know, we're also, we're seeing this shift in the military itself, mm -hmm. but then we're also seeing the space race, right? And everything's sort of shifting as um, the United States is trying to get to the moon um, and get into outer space and NASA is growing exponentially. And we know, of course, that a lot of famous astronauts um, had military backgrounds. You know, what is the role of women there? Right, and that's why the last thing that I want to show that it's on this on this slide is a is a letter from a young that a young woman received from NASA in the '60s, and that's that's why this is so important. Why women were not allowed in the military? This is a letter, and we actually have two letters like this. I'll talk about this one first, and then the other one we have in the collection. Um, uh, this young woman wrote to NASA and said, "Gee, I'd love to be an astronaut. How can I help the space race?" and they wrote back and said, oh, maybe you can be a mathematician or a computer or something, but you know, we don't need you little lady to be an astronaut because we need pilots. We need, we have men pilots to do that. People that are coming out that were test pilots and military pilots. And I'm always struck by the women who actually kept the, kept these. The other, the other collection we have is actually one that was sent to Sally Ride, who was the first American woman into space. And the woman said, I got this as a child. It says almost exactly the same thing, saying that, that women aren't qualified because they can't, they're not test pilots, basically. That um, she actually framed her photo and has it hanging up in her law office as a reminder that she can, you know, that somebody told her no, but to continue to burst through these different um, glass ceilings. And she sent it to Sally Ride when she became the first woman in space. And she's like, you know, for all of us that got a letter like this, thank you for being that woman. But the reason Sally Ride was able to go up into space is there was a real shift uh, from military pilots to, uh, you know, space scientists were able to get in. So Sally Ride and um, all those early, Catherine Sullivan, all those early women who were involved in that came from the science point of view. They all had doctorate in science. Now what happens is you see in 1977, finally the Air Force says, okay, women, we will train people to, train women to, to fly planes. 1993, they're like, okay, we will now train you to do combat and do test pilot stuff. Then you start seeing immediately after that people like Eileen Collins and Pam Melroy, who are uh, the first two women who commanded the space shuttle during flights. They could do that and they came from that as astronaut pilots because they finally had the opportunity. They finally were allowed to get that experience through the military so that they qualified and could do that. So I just think it's a really interesting um, story arc because it's like women have wanted to be in the military, they have been told no, but it has all these long ranging effects. And you know, I mean, there's still issues with like, you know, that there's more, of course, more men than women in the military. So the planes are for their sizes, not so much for women's sizes. That has a huge implication on what women could fly, what planes, and just limits it, uh, their participation in these various activities. And I think it's just, um, you know, now we're finally seeing women that have been since 77 who have been pilots, 
and have had these long careers. And while the numbers are still small, I'm hoping that we'll see a change. One of the collections that I'm really excited about that we're putting in right now, and we'll go be heading to the Transcription Center, is uh, there is a, uh, one of our Verville fellows did oral interviews with 16 uh, retired uh, women pilots. Um, and their, the oral interviews and the transcripts of those will go up. And I can't wait because that's kind of a nice ending to this is you can say, okay, here's 16 people who did actually end up having careers. And what did they have to say about the discrimination and that they, and the different things that they um, faced on that. So I think it'll be very nice. So I guess I want to say to our volunteers, please keep coming back because we're going to keep putting uh, military aviation material out there. Um, and uh, it's a great story that needs to be told. Yeah, there's a lot more that we um, still have to uncover and explore together, um, which is really exciting. Um, and Emily is putting uh, some, some direct links to those new projects that we talked about and then other projects that you can explore like Sally Wright's papers, because um, we did transcribe um, more than 4,000 pages of her professional materials last year, which is incredible. And she, of course, talks a lot about her experiences as a woman in NASA and sort of the, there's a lot of speech notes and stuff about her role as the first woman in space. And Pam Melroy, we're working on that finding aid. Remember, okay. she was one of the, she was the second one. And she is now the new, uh, Biden has just done her as deputy chair of NASA. Oh, and she's wow. going to be fabulous in that role. Just, she's a wonderful uh, professional woman. But anyway, there's, there's tons of great stuff. The reason I loved her collection, it wasn't just the astronaut, it's all her military test pilot stuff is in oh. there. So it is it is just uh, going to be a joy to, to go through there and look at that. And and I should mention to people who are watching that we had talked earlier and I said, you know, I, I feel nervous about this. And I normally don't feel nervous, but I just want to convey to everybody the wonderful collections we have. Yeah. And, and just so these women get their due, because they really were at the forefront and just refused refused not to be counted. They just kept knocking at that glass. I must say it's, it it's really incredible and not to, you know, reveal too much of my own uh, sort of interests here, but um, I was never, when I first came to the Smithsonian six years ago, I wasn't that interested in air and space um, archives because I didn't think that, that there would be this breadth of content. And, mm -hmm. and after exploring these collections through transcription and with our volunteers for this long, I mean, it's, it's truly incredible, the stories and the, the richness of kind of the diverse voices that are exposed here. And, you know, these sort of little tidbits that you see, even in these published articles about, um, uh, you know, these women in the, in the early 20th century, these, these early women pilots, they, you know, make jabs at their uh, male peers saying, you know, well, I have more flight hours and I can fly better and I can race faster and I have more trophies. And it's truly delightful. Um, <laughs> Linda Haynes has said, um, uh, as a woman pilot, hell yes, in the comments here, I was told when I was learning to fly that if God wanted women to fly, he would not have made the sky blue. I told him to watch a sunset. That's incredible. <laughs> That's um, and good. Linda said that she was also friends with B. Stedman, one of the women ah. who qualified, and she wrote the book, The Right Stuff But the Wrong Sex. That's incredible. Um, I will say right. as a little plug for other books about female aviators, um, there's a lot of publications that have been done by the Smithsonian on U.S. women in aviation and the history of aviation. And we have um, the Air and Space Archives has a lot of the research notes compiled by the Smithsonian staff who worked on those publications. Um, and we have transcribed all of those too, which of course talk about a lot of these women. Yes, yeah, so Patty has a copy right there because of course. Yeah, and I, I would say I wanted to show this because this is, we have for this, this is the thickest one and this is 1940 to 1985. And at the time this came, out this was like one of the it's by Debbie Douglas a, a wonderful historian um, and it was this was like everything and in 1985 women still weren't 
piloting combat. I mean, there's like a little notion that now women are going to be able to fly some of the military aircraft, but still combat was, was off. So it's just amazing to see in these last, you know, 30 some years, the opportunities people have been doing and the wonderful research that's come out uh, talking about these women and their stories. Absolutely. But yes, there is a bunch of material in here about uh, the WASP and also that that is being put live and also we have several more collections uh on wasp that we're in the process of scanning and that will go in to be transcribed and then that's really great because then you have three or four different collections three or four yeah. collections from different women their experiences and then you can start to see how are they the same how are they different what did they and collect what did they think we also transcribed Helen Ritchie's flight log, who was yes. a laugh as well, and then went on to become a commercial airline pilot. She was actually a commercial airline pilot before she got done with the WASP. It was oh. mostly a stint, uh, a publicity uh, stunt, and she actually committed suicide because she yes, was so distraught. Yes, she faced as well. After the WASP, she could not find, she couldn't find a job because it was just, all the men were coming back, yep. and they had more hours, and... The way the society was set up, it was always going to go to a man. It was always going to go to a man unless, you know, like in the case when she was for that short time, it was more of a publicity stunt. Yeah, they, and a lot of the her, airlines, we don't have her personal documents in Transcription Center. We just have her flight log. Um, but a lot of her, you know, she wrote a lot. A lot of her colleagues and her friends shared that she expressed a lot of dismay and frustration, obviously. Um, like the Louise Thayden papers talk yeah, about it quite a bit. She was quite close with discrimination. Helen. Yeah. Um, we have one question. As the mall museum undergoes transformation, um, as many of you know, it's being renovated right now. Will the new galleries include pointers to the availability of all the cool stories of women and minorities available through the archives? I know more of the stories will be told, but so many people have no idea of these archives. That's so true. That's a good question, Mary. Thank you. Well, I think we are definitely working with the curators to use things from our collection. And there is over an overall real push to include all these stories uh, into the collection. Like I know the Speed Gallery is going to have a lot about Jackie Cochran. If you remember, she was the head of Wasp, a uh, fine pilot, set a lot of speed records. So they're, they're really looking at it to, I mean, the whole thing is, is we want anybody to be walking to the museum and at some point during their visit here say, that's somebody like me. Yes. And they were able to get it. You have to yes. kind of see it to be it. And so they're going to be doing that. And one way, you know, is by, you know, the curators using things from our collection. You know, if you read it, you, people will be able to see that that material came from us. But it's certainly, you know, work in progress, just trying to get people aware of what we have. And which is what's so great about the Transcription Center, again, is just that, you know, it's engaging people in a different way. It's making it more accessible and it's bringing people in. And that's a wonderful thing. And we're finding, you know, even all of our curators and archivists and catalogers and collections specialists and collection managers at the Smithsonian who put their blood, sweat and tears into making these collections cataloged and processed mm -hmm. and preserved. Um, it's, it's impossible for us to look through every single word. And so by all of you transcribing this stuff, we're sort of uncovering and unlocking even more of those details. And we've had Air and Space Museum curators and archivists come to us with, you know, some huge, thick, scribbled handwriting diary saying, let's transcribe this so that we can more easily pull out content for exhibits, which is Right. really exciting yeah um, several of the world war ii diaries and and a japanese diary actually yes. was translate and that was like transcribed and translated and that was like wonderful for our curators because uh the work was done and then they could utilize that and it's being incorporated into the exhibit so the work you do here will be used not only by the staff and the public but will show up in exhibits that are Look it makes a major impact, and, and I hope yeah. that you all know that, um, even if you just transcribe one word. Um, Mary suggested, I love this idea, Mary, we'll definitely be talking about this later amongst our colleagues, um, but having QR codes providing links to the Transcription Center in the exhibits, that's a really cool idea. I love that. Thank nice. you for that, Mary. Um, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and yeah, we will be having, you know, like we said, not only have we launched these new collections today um, on the WASPs and on Helen James, um, but just as Patty said, we're going to be launching even more materials from the Air and Space Museum archives related to women's history, um, related to the history of aviation and space, um, and uh, be not only in America, but beyond. Um, we do have the Lian Qing papers um that we're going to be launching um next month she was a chinese pilot um, she was a chinese nationalist that came over during world war uh two to to gain uh train in and did flights to run money yes for the, yeah. <laughs> for the chinese during world war ii so fascinating yeah her story yeah. is really incredible so so keep an eye out for that as well um and then of course if any of you come across anything particularly interesting um or exciting, um, or you just want to say hi and share your discoveries and your transcription experience with us, please don't hesitate to reach out through email or social media. Um, and uh, Emily put all of the information up on the screen. Thank you, Emily, um, for our website, our email address, and our uh, Twitter handle there. Um, we will be doing this uh, every month. Our next collections deep dive uh, in May will be with the African American History and Culture Museum on the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre and related collections that we are transcribing for that. So please stay tuned for more updates about that. And please, of course, reach out to us with any questions. And thank you so much, Patty. This was so energizing. I, I have um, a question. I realize I should put yes, my hand. Please. I just want to say for those of you who are uh, participating in this, we are actively collecting in this area uh, of women pilots, women military pilots. If you happen to have a background in that and have material you'd be interested in don donating to us, or you know of somebody that we should uh, that we should contact, please let me know um, because we would love to build uh, this area up in our collections, and we need more to tell the story. So please send out the word uh, to. And if you guys email us at that email address, we'll get that straight to Patty. Yeah, yeah. So love it. So please. I, I, I hope, I always hope when I do these things, and it usually works out that we get something, somebody finds out about it and wants to donate something. So I'm hoping that's the case here as well. Yes, fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, and that we'll learn even more together about these women as we transcribe more collections. So thank you, Patty. Thank you all for coming and joining us today. Um, I hope that you learned something. I learned something for sure. Um, and we hope to see you in the Transcription Center uh, in the coming days, weeks, years. All right, everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you all so much.